Acropolis, a hive well known for being a major trade hub. Merchant guilds maintain a balance of trade until members from all sects started disappearing. In the night hours, fires dot the sectors with charred ashes being all that remains. For the most part, the clan houses have turned a blind eye to the ever-increasing cult of redemption propaganda. That is until a top guild of coin agent and house escher sister went missing. The embers of fire have been stoked, and the ensuing conflict could jeopardize the stability of the entire hive as we know it. Welcome back to our fourth season of Necromunda on the channel Ashes of Acropolis. This season will be a bit different as content is releasing a bit faster than we can keep up with. We will be playing a loose campaign of sorts with the freedom to introduce new gangs as we go along, including a mixture of Hive and Ashways battles. Fighters will still go into recovery, potentially die, and more, but we won't be fighting over territory and the additional benefits that it may provide. In our first match of the season, we'll have House Caldor's Brethren of Judgment versus House Escher's Howling Banshees. Let's take a look at the opening gang for House Caldor and how they have spent their opening 1,000 credits. House Caldor is led by Priest Gabriel. He carries a stub gun and chain axe with exterminator. He wears mesh armor. His skill is unshakable conviction, allowing him to make reactions while seriously injured. He also can't be targeted by coup de gras and may get additional movement via double action. Ezekiel is a deacon with an eviscerator and mesh armor. His skill is restless faith, allowing him to be part of the crew while in recovery in exchange for a flesh wound. The firebrand Jedediah carries a heavy crossbow and flak armor. He has the step aside skill. Lazarus is a Redemptionist Brethren Specialist with Grenade Launcher and Flak Armor. Zachariah is a Brethren with Blunderbuss and Flak. Kane is the same with a Reclaimed Autogun. Isaiah is a Redemptionist Brethren with Autogun and Exterminator. Tobiah and Micah are Barehanded Bone Pickers. They follow the path of the Faithful and start with 9 Fighters and a Gang Rating of 1000. We welcome back our Season 2 champions, the Howling Banshees of House Escher. The Queen, Sable, leads the crew with a Shock Whip, Needle Pistol, and Mesh Armor. She has the Spring Up skill. Lilith, the Death Maiden, accompanies her with a Needle Pistol and Venom Claw. She also has Spring Up. A Matriarch, Cirrus, carries a Plasma Gun with Spring Up. Jax, a Sister Specialist, also carries a Plasma Gun with Flak Armor. Blythe, Trist, and Pixie are all sisters with last guns and flak armor. Terra, a little sister, accompanies them with last pistol and stiletto knife. In total, eight fighters and a gang rating of 1,000. Today's scenario is beat down from the House of Chains book. Crews are random, D3 plus 4. House Cardor rolls for six fighters, but will get all nine due to devout masses. House Escher rolls for seven fighters with a specialist Jax sitting this one out. Tactics cards for House Caldor are custom too. They choose no prisoners, making their enemies that are seriously injured and recovery test rolls. They roll two dice and pick the worst. They also take Divine Avatar, giving one of their champions the terrifying ability. Enemies will have to pass a willpower check in order to shoot or fight him. House Escher gets a custom 2 plus 1 random for the underdog. They choose Mistress of Death and Gift of the Matron. This allows their Death Maiden to become standing and active again after taking someone out of action. A fighter can also add a Chem Alchemy stem effect. They randomly draw Scrag, which makes enemy fighters within 9 inches take nerve checks when a fighter goes out of action. They also have a minus 2 modifier when taking that test. In this scenario, House Escher will deploy a fighter first anywhere on the battlefield. Fighters will then alternate placement within 12 inches of that first fighter. These gangs have been engaged in discussion when words escalate to violence. In round 1, only a single random fighter per team is readied. In each subsequent priority phase, each gang can choose to ready a number of fighters equal to the current round. Fighters without ready markers take no part in the battle, provide no benefits, and can't be targeted by attacks or receive any damage from blasts, templates, etc. We are slightly modifying this to where both gangs must activate a number of fighters equal to the current battle round. 
The battle ends after a priority phase where only one gang has fighters with ready markers remaining on the battlefield, and victory goes to that side. This should be an interesting one. Let's gear up for Season 4, Ashes of Acropolis. Thank you, as always, for watching. Turn 1 is coming up next. And this battle is certainly going to see an escalation as turn 1 priority rolls come out first. House Caldor will be up. Fighters are spread around the battlefield. Micah is just going to pick that activation up and not move. Blythe is going to activate and use both of her actions to move. That brings us to the end of round 1. Faith Dice going out, getting plus 3 due to the champions and the leader on the board. And they're going to get a total of 5 that are going into their pool. Turn two priority rolls going out, and it looks like House Cardor will be up again. Kane will activate first, makes a dash across the board, getting into cover, and then we've got a move from Trist up top as she relocates on the roof. She is going to point that last gun down at Ezekiel. She will get a plus one for being short range, but he is in a full cover. This will require fives in order to hit. She does have to pass a willpower check first as he is terrifying. Due to that tactics card played at the beginning of the game, she will pass that willpower check and the shot will crack. That is going to be a miss, however. The Deacon Ezekiel then activates and he is going to use both of his actions to move getting out of line of sight. Lilith the Death Maiden then activates. She uses both of her actions to move, again unable to do anything against fighters that do not have ready markers. Two Faith Dice were generated, and we go right into turn three, where House Escher is up. The Matriarch Cirrus is going to use both of her actions to move, getting out of line of sight. The Priest Gabriel is then going to use both of his actions to move down to the stairs. And then we swing back over to House Escher, where Trist is going to relocate one more time with that last gun. She is going to take a shot at the Priest. Triss does have that last gun. She is within short range. That will offset partial cover here, so it will just be her base of four that is required to hit. Last gun fires, and it does connect with Gabriel, who goes down pinned. He will take an initiative check to see if he falls, needing a four plus. That will fail, so he will fall down to the next level. It is not a 3-inch fall, however, so no damage will be assessed. He will just go down pinned. Strength 3 against his Toughness 3 requires force to wound, and that is going to do a wound. There's no AP on this weapon, but his mesh armor is going to save him, needing a 5-up. Back to the middle of the board, we have Lazarus, who is going to target the Queen Sable, and he has a grenade launcher, loads a crack grenade into it, and fires across the board. He aims down to a 3, but partial cover will bring that back to a 4. That is going to hit, and ammo checks required needing a 6+, plus. that's failed. While that weapon does hit, it is out of ammo. Strength 6 against her toughness 3 requires 2s in order to wound. That will do a wound, and it's AP-2, so it cuts through her mesh armor and does 2 damage. We roll out an injury die, and it is an out of action for the Queen. A D66 rolling up for her, and that is a 42, which is a grievous injury. The remaining move goes back to House Cawdor, and Jedediah the Firebrand is going to relocate with his actions. And that brings us to the end of turn three. They did get up two more Faith Dice, bringing their total Faith Pool to nine. They are now fully stacked as they have to ready up four fighters now in preparation for turn four. And priority rolls come out for turn four. House Escher will be up. And with House Escher up first, Blythe is going to make a move back and then she is going to target Kane with her last gun. Does have him short range. That is going to increase her ballistic skill by one, taking her to a three to hit and has him in the open. Dice come out, and that is going to be a hit. Kane will go down pinned. Strength 3 against Toughness 3 will need 4s in order to wound. It is going to do a wound. 
Flak Arbor on Kane gives him a 6 plus save. That is going to be failed, so an injury die will be rolled out for him, and he is going out of action. So House Escher now with a strike onto the Brethren of Judgment. D66 rolled up, it will be a 21. Action continues with Jedediah, the Firebrand. He is going to let loose with that crossbow. Firing as a frag grenade on the tip of it. He is easily going to hit as his ballistic skill is a 3. Strength 4 on this weapon versus her toughness of 4. 4 is to wound. She is going to be wounded. She's also knocked back into the wall, increasing the damage by 1. She does wear mesh armor. That is going to be failed. The damage will be 2 as she is punched into the wall. That takes her down with a serious injury. Up top, Trist is going to react. She is going to aim first, but he is going to be behind heavy cover, so fives will be needed to hit with all modifiers included. And that shot cracks out. That is going to be a hit. Jedediah will go down pinned. He's a toughness of three, so fours are needed to wound. There will not be a wound. Ezekiel then activates. He is going to move forward, and then he is going to unleash that template weapon. The Eviscerator will auto-hit Blythe, and it will be at strength 3. We'll take an ammo check, and that is going to be fine. Fours are required to wound at strength 3 versus toughness 3. That is good. This is AP minus 1, so her flak armor is going to be a 6-up save. That is going to be failed, so an injury die will be rolled out for her. First, we're going to see if she catches on fire. She does not. But the injury die is going to come out next, and it is going to be a flesh wound. Back to the Howling Banshees, Cirrus is going to use both of her moves to reposition, looking to get a jump on that Firebrand on the next turn. We've then got the Priest Gabriel, who is going to pick himself up off the ground and use his second action to move. The Death Maiden, Lilith, is then going to crawl, trying to get behind some cover. And that brings us to the end of turn four, so action starting to heat up here as the escalation continues. Next up, five fighters per side will have to be activated. In the end phase, we are going to take a bottle check for House Escher as they do have enough fighters down to where they could potentially fail. They will not. In rolling up for the Death Maiden, no prisoners was taken by House Cawdor in this one, so two injury dice will need to be rolled out, and we have to pick the worst. It is going to be an out of action for Lilith. D66 will be rolled up for her. The result of that is going to be a 34, which is grievous. Priority rolls coming up for turn 5. It will go to House Escher. However, they are going to voluntarily bottle and flee the battlefield. Given that they are now down the Queen as well as the Death Maiden, even what happens here, if she stands and tries to take a shot at Ezekiel, she will need to pass a willpower check in order for that shot to even go off. The Matriarch can get the jump over there on the Firebrand in the corner, but all of House Escher's fighters would have to activate this turn, and they are going to be in a lot of trouble as they are surrounded by Caldor fighters. So this game is going to end a bit prematurely. Was looking forward to play a lot more of this one. Took a lot of time setting up this terrain, so I always hate when they kind of end like this. But we are playing a campaign, so it's not just about this game. It is about the future games to come. We are going to talk a little bit of post-game here, and that just really went south for House Escher quickly. Big shot from a crack grenade and a big heavy crossbow hit took the Queen and Death Maiden out of action. The game was just not going to end well after that. The scenario I thought was interesting. If you play by the book, activating fighters is actually optional, so this could really lead to some wacky interactions. We wanted to see that escalation of action happen, so we made activating the fighters mandatory with the number of rounds that we played. I actually didn't mind the scenario, but House Caldor can be downright scary in mid-short range game. The template weapon that they have, the Eviscerator, is AP-1 and the Heavy Crossbow. It's got a 5-inch blast template at Strength 4. We didn't have any articles of faith or anything like that that we used but you know for house escher a really unlucky injury roll for the queen the girls just felt out positioned and outgunned as caldor fighter activations didn't allow them any plasma shots or for the death maiden to do anything the house of faith is going to take the initial victory and go to one and oh while house escher will start this campaign at zero and one 
I certainly hope you enjoyed being here on the channel and watching this battle report. It is good to be playing Necromunda again. Thanks so much to the 2022 Coffee Supporters Club. Your names are up on the screen now, and you're also represented on a piece of terrain throughout this little hive of mine. There will be a lot more games coming down the pipe. We will see you in the next one. Take care.